and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Specifically, one of tonight's stories includes mentions of physical and sexual violence against a child. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening, my friends, and welcome back to Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and we've got a pair of nice little chillers for you this evening, guaranteed to make your skin crawl. To start, we'll be reading The Red Phone Box by Finn McCool. Carl and Alice are two teenaged siblings living in southern England, and life isn't going that well for them. Their mother has recently passed away, and they have been left in the care of Jeff, their stepfather. To say that Jeff is a bastard of the first degree would be an understatement, and some of his tastes would put other evil fairy tale step parents to shame. Carl has been escaping to a nearby phone booth, one of the few places he can be alone. One day, it starts to ring. After that, we'll be jumping into Bird's Eye View by Evan Baufman. Our story opens with Brett in a precarious situation, in a tree, a hundred feet above the ground. Even though he's wearing safety equipment and is on a supervised zipline tour, all he can focus on is keeping his acrophobia at bay. That, and trying to not embarrass himself in front of his new girlfriend, Lisa. Little does Brett know that his fear of heights will become the least of his problems. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012... Visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today and get instant access. Did I mention they're ad-free? Thank you for your support. And now, from author Finn McCool, I present The Red Phone Box. 
Those of a certain age who grew up in the UK will remember the old-style red phone boxes emblazoned with the royal crown and with the motif telephone written above their glass-paneled swing doors. You've probably seen photographs of these booths, which are regarded as quintessentially British, acting as tourist attractions in London and elsewhere. Few active red booths are left these days, as there isn't much call for payphones in general, not in an age where everybody carries a smartphone. Nevertheless, one such booth is central to the story I'm going to tell you, a paranormal event that occurred 25 years ago, while I was still in my teens and going through a particularly traumatic time in my life. I grew up in a small village in the rural south of England, a quaint but unremarkable hamlet with little to mark out from hundreds of others dotted across the home counties. We lived in a cramped but cozy bungalow in a housing estate on the edge of the village. Across the street from us stood a forest that dated back to Anglo-Saxon times and was inevitably the site of various local legends. The phone booth in question was set just off the pavement and on the forest's edge, facing directly out towards the woods. It was a local landmark of sorts. The area was dimly lit and isolated at night, and so became a convenient place for local teens to meet at the weekends, to smoke, drink, and engage in clumsy sexual encounters. I'll admit to frequenting the site myself for those very reasons. At first, I was looking for those cheap thrills, but in time, I went there to escape from the house. And that's when the strange events began. I can't fully explain what happened all those years ago, but I owe my life to that mysterious phone box and the paranormal entities somehow tied to it. Let me begin by telling you a little bit about my family. Looking back, my early childhood was idyllic. I was the eldest of two, just me and my little sister Alice. Our natural father left when we were both small, and I never saw him again. My mother was our rock, though. She raised us on her own, showing amazing strength and love. Mum worked hard to provide for us, And although we certainly weren't rich, she ensured Alice and I never went without. I won't claim everything was always rosy. There were fights and hardships, and I could occasionally be a strappy teenager, bored of life in a small village and often driving Mum up the wall with my rebellious nature. It's true that you never appreciate your mother and all she does for you, not until it's too late. Things started to go downhill shortly after my 15th birthday. That's when Jeff came into our lives. I'll never entirely understand why our mum got together with him. Sure, he was handsome and charming, on the surface at least. She was lonely when he came in and swept her off her feet. I didn't like Jeff from the start. There was a degree of jealousy, and I saw him as a rival for my mother's affections. But still, the man got my hackles up, and I was always suspicious of him. I didn't like how he spoke to me, and how he looked at Alice. But I knew he would never have tried anything while our mum was around. She would have killed him if he had ever touched either of us. I'm sure our mother would have eventually seen through Jeff and given him the boot, but then she got sick. When you're a kid, you always think your parent will be around forever. I certainly took her for granted back then. Mum would have done anything to protect us, and so it's no surprise that she played down her illness, telling Alice and me there was nothing to worry about and she would be fine. And so, she attended hospital appointments and started chemotherapy treatment, all while trying to carry on as normal, looking after her children as she'd always done. But, as strong as she was, the cancer was too far along. 
I'll never forget those last few weeks in the hospital. The shock, anger, and fear I experienced when I realized she wouldn't make it. Mum told me to stay strong for my sister, and I did try, but it was a terrible time. Every day she got weaker as she lay in the hospital bed. Eventually she couldn't speak, move, or even acknowledge our presence. That was the hardest part for me, to see such a strong and vibrant woman reduced to this, wasting away in front of our very eyes. It was almost a relief when she finally stopped breathing, but of course, that's when the real nightmare began. I can hardly remember the funeral as my sister and I were almost paralyzed in a grief-fueled haze. Jeff became our legal guardian soon after. I'll always need to understand why this was allowed to happen. It was because no one else took responsibility for us. Our natural father was long gone, and our grandparents lived up north. Jeff was our only option if we wanted to stay in our home. At the time, I wondered why Jeff wanted to keep us. Why didn't he just do a runner after Mum died? Initially, he just wanted the council house we lived in and to milk the system for whatever child benefits he could claim. Only later did I realize he had a much more sinister agenda. I remember the first time he hit me. It was only a few weeks after Mum's funeral, but his whole attitude towards us had already changed. For my part, I was still dealing with grief and was prone to mood swings. Jeff had ordered me to take the rubbish out to the bins, and I talked back. That's all it took to provoke him. I didn't see the punch coming as he hit me hard in the stomach. Jeff was a big guy, and the blow hurt, taking the wind out of me as I bent over in pain, struggling to regain my breath. Afterward, he coldly warned me against telling anyone what had happened. He said no one would believe me, and, even if they did, the result would be us being taken into care, and my sister and I would get sent to separate foster homes. I guess that Jeff was a practiced abuser because he knew how to cover his tracks. Sadly, the beatings became a semi-regular occurrence, and I learned to live with them. My biggest fear was that he'd start hitting Alice too, but he acted differently around her. My sister seemed to be his favorite, and I didn't like how he was around her, how he looked at her and touched her. Deep down, I knew he was hurting her when I wasn't around. Alice didn't talk about it to me, but I could see the change in her. She went from being bubbly and outgoing to withdrawn and depressed. Part of it was due to the grief, but there was something else, too. I guess I couldn't admit it to myself. The truth was too horrible and sickening to contemplate. As the weeks passed, I spent less and less time in the house, sneaking out at night to hang out in the streets, and my favorite spot to hide was the wooden bench beside the old red phone booth, facing out towards the darkened woods. And that's where my story begins. The evening when I took my first call was unremarkable. It was a Wednesday evening in November, a cold and windy night out on the streets. Any sensible person would be at home in front of the fire, but I didn't want to return to our cottage because I knew he'd be there. I had a four-pack of beer cans and a pack of cigarettes I'd managed to buy from the supermarket using a fake ID. The drink and smokes helped take the edge off as I nursed my bruises and lay down on the hard bench, staring up at the stars above while I contemplated my place in what I considered a cruel universe. That's when I was surprised by the sudden ringing of the phone. The sound took me off guard, making me jump up from the bench. I recall staring suspiciously at the phone box, illuminated by a small light inside the booth. I assumed the incoming call would be the wrong number. 
Initially, I ignored the ringing as I thought whoever was on the other end would hang up, but this didn't happen. Eventually, I pulled myself up off the bench and sluggishly made my way over to the booth, opening the glass-plated swing door and entering. I experienced a moment's hesitation as I reached out to grab the phone, and on some level, I knew this wasn't going to be a normal wrong number. Nevertheless, I sheepishly picked up the receiver and spoke. Hello, I said. Carl, it's me, came the unexpected response. I recognized the voice straight away. Just three words were spoken, but they brought a chill down my spine. It was my mother, apparently speaking to me from beyond the grave. I stuttered, finding myself unable to speak as my confused brain attempted to make sense of this. I couldn't find the words to reply, and so she had to prompt me. Carl, I know it's hard to believe, but it's really me. It's important that we talk. There was something eerie and unsettling about the way she spoke and the tone of her voice. It certainly sounded like my mother, but something was off. It was like a part of her was missing, and I heard an awful sadness in her voice that she'd never had in life. I told myself this had to be a trick. Somebody was playing a sick joke on me, and I wasn't happy about it. Listen, you evil witch, I spat out angrily. I don't know what you're playing at. I didn't get to finish my tirade before she cut me off. Don't you dare speak to me like that! I was shocked into silence by her sharp rebuke. This was my mother, all right. I'd been told off by her enough times to recognize that tone. I experienced an intense emotion at that moment, as all my pent-up grief threatened to spill out. Mom, I spluttered between sobs. I don't understand. You're gone. I held your hand when you died. We buried you. I know it's hard to take in, Carl, and I know you were there when I passed away, and I'm so sorry you and your sister had to go through that. You were both so brave at the funeral, and I was so proud. She paused briefly before speaking again. I don't have much time. You need to listen carefully to me, son. We can talk on this phone. I don't fully understand it, but this line links the mortal world with the afterlife. I shook my head, my hand shaking as I struggled to hold on to the receiver. I noticed how my mother's voice wasn't the only sound I could hear on the other end of the line. The background noises were faint at first, but steadily grew louder. To my horror, I realized I could hear screaming, the sound of many souls crying out in terror and pain. And there was something else, too, a cruel cackling that sounded almost inhuman. I felt so scared at that moment, sensing my mother was in danger, and I was powerless to help. Mom, what's happening? I whimpered fearfully. I could hear the anxiety in her voice as she spoke more quickly. I'm out of time, but we will speak again. Come back to this booth at the same time tomorrow night. But this is important. When we talk, you must stay inside the booth. Don't step outside or open the door until you replace the receiver and end the call. Do you understand? I could tell she was serious by the tone of her voice, and it frightened me. For the first time during the conversation, I noticed what was happening outside the booth as I glanced out onto the street and the darkened woods beyond. I noticed that the road was now cloaked in darkness, as all the streetlights seemed to have gone out. Now, the only illumination came from the dim moonlight. The forest was eerily silent, 
I couldn't hear any local wildlife or even the rustle of leaves in the wind. But there was something behind the tree line. The dark shadow of a creature or person that I couldn't identify. I experienced an almost primal fear as my eyes followed the black shape moving between the trees, edging ever closer to the phone booth I occupied. I had no idea what this creature was, but sensed that it held malicious intent, and I was its target. Somehow, I knew this monster wasn't of our world. I almost dropped the receiver and succumbed to blind panic, but my mother's voice pulled me back. Carl, listen to me now. It can't hurt you as long as you stay inside the booth. The wailing and cackling on her end were much louder now, to the point where my mother needed to shout to be heard over the awful din. Put the phone down now, she said firmly. We will speak again soon. I love you, son. I love you too, Mom. I replied emotionally before the call abruptly ended. And suddenly, it was over. The dark entity had vanished, and the streetlights came back on. It took me several minutes to compose myself and work up the courage to exit the phone booth. When I eventually did, I found nothing was amiss. The street had returned to normal, and there was no evidence that any paranormal event had ever taken place. I wandered home in a daze, relieved to find that Jeff had fallen asleep on the sofa after downing half a bottle of whiskey. I lay on my bed all night, unable to sleep as I tried to come to terms with what had happened. I thought about my mum and feared she was in grave danger. I didn't know what the creature in the woods was, but in my heart I realized it was something evil. I won't deny that I was very scared, but I knew I would go back to the phone booth the next night. Frankly, I had no other choice. I got to the bench early the next evening and waited impatiently for the call. I didn't drink, but did smoke like a chimney in an unsuccessful attempt to calm my nerves. I felt tense enough already, but almost jumped out of my skin when I saw a figure approaching along the dimly lit footpath. It was my sister, Alice, coming down to see me. What the hell are you doing here? I shouted out. Well, it's nice to see you too, brother, she shot back, the hurt evident in her voice. I couldn't help my hostility. This wasn't a safe situation, and I didn't want my sister here. I hadn't told her anything about what had happened the previous night, and didn't wish to expose her to whatever this was. Somehow, I needed to get rid of her before Mum's call came in. She sat down beside me, and I saw her red, puffy eyes, meaning she'd been crying. Can I have one of those? she asked, pointing down to my cigarettes. You shouldn't be smoking, I answered, going into full big brother mode. Neither should you, she shot back defiantly. I shrugged and passed her a cigarette, lighting it for her as we smoked together. I suddenly forgot about my business for that evening as I worried about my sister. What has he done to you now? I asked, trying in vain to hide my anger. She shook her head and couldn't meet my eye. It doesn't matter. I can handle him. I'll kill him if he hurts you again, was my furious reply. No, you won't, Alice cried. If anything happens to him, they'll take us into care. You know that. She was right, of course, but this didn't make it any easier to hear. My anger and frustration was nothing compared to the hatred in my heart for him. I was thinking about what to say next when the phone started ringing. I cursed, realizing I'd left it too late. My sister was a part of this now, and I had to let her in. Alice, we've got to take that call. You need to come into the phone booth with me. What are you talking about? 
she replied with a look of bafflement on her face. You need to trust me, sister. This is really important. She still didn't look convinced, but Alice took my hand and followed me into the phone box, and we picked up the receiver together. My babies are united. Thank God you're both safe. I saw the shock and disbelief in my sister's eyes when she first heard our mother's voice. She was going through the same roller coaster of emotions I'd experienced the night before. Mom? Alice muttered. Is that really you? Yes, baby, it's me. I know what you've been going through and want you to know you're not alone. Your brother and I love you very much, and we will stop him. I was shocked to hear her say this. Somehow, my dead mother knew Alice was being abused. Was this the reason she'd made contact from the other side? And could she really help us? I had so many questions to ask, but there was no time. I heard my mother scream, and suddenly, the line went dead. Alice and I shouted down the phone as we feared for our mum and the horrors she was facing. But, as it turned out, we had our own problems. Alice saw it first, and she cried out in absolute terror. I looked out and saw what had spooked her. It was the same entity I'd witnessed the night before the black shadow standing just beyond the tree line. I couldn't make out its features or see a face in the darkness, but realized the monster glared directly at us, poised like a predator ready to pounce. My sister panicked and went for the door, trying to escape from this monstrosity standing before us. Luckily, I remembered what Mum had said and grabbed hold of my sister, holding her tight and keeping her inside the phone box, where I hoped we would be safe. At that moment, I heard a new voice on the other end of the line, a chilling, deep male voice full of malice and seemingly devoid of humanity. Greetings, my children. I'm sorry to interrupt your conversation with your beloved mother, but, alas, she is otherwise engaged. My anger overcame my fear, and I shouted down the phone. Who the hell are you? What have you done to my mom? The man, or creature, or whatever he was, laughed cruelly before replying. Now, now, young man, your mother is quite fine, for now at least. She's my guest here, but alas, I cannot guarantee her safety indefinitely. Many wicked spirits are in this realm, and I cannot hold them back forever. I was left confused and scared, facing a situation that was beyond my understanding. I saw only pure, unadulterated terror in my sister's eyes. I realized then that I needed to speak with this entity... There was no other choice. Who are you? I repeated. What do you want from us? There was a noticeable annoyance in his voice as he answered. Who am I? I'm the one in possession of your mother's soul. I could condemn her to an eternity of suffering and pain if I was so inclined. Alternatively, I may allow her to leave and ascend to a better place but there's a price to be paid. A soul for a soul. I'll set your mother free when you deliver a suitable replacement. I shivered, watching the dark shadow as I struggled to breathe. What do you mean? I whimpered. You know very well what I mean, was the angry response. Bring him to this place tomorrow night and wait for my call. Keep him outside of the booth, and my servant will do the rest. And with that, the call came to an abrupt end. I carefully replaced the receiver and comforted my sister, assuring her that the shadow beast had gone. Alice looked up at me with tears in her eyes, 
but she spoke with fiery defiance and determination. We've got to do this for Mum. I nodded my head in confirmation. We needed to be strong now. I knew what was coming would be challenging and unpleasant, but it had to be done. And so we made our plans and prepared to set events in motion. Some may judge me for what I did that next evening. I can assure you that it wasn't an easy decision, and I'll live with the consequences of my actions for the rest of my life. I argue that he deserved what was coming to him after what he put me and my sister through. Perhaps this is true. But in the end, I did it for my mother. She'd given us her life, so I owed it to her. I needed to make sure she had peace in the next world. After much arguing with Alice, I insisted that I'd be the one to lure him out. My sister would be waiting for me by the phone box. It was a risky plan, and we had to get the timing just right. I found Jeff slouched on the sofa in front of the TV. He stank of booze and had a mean look on his reddened face. It didn't take much to provoke Jeff's anger, and I intended to push him over the edge. He glared up at me when I entered the room, his bloodshot eyes looking over me with complete contempt. What the hell do you want? He spat out. I shook my head and let it all out, speaking the truth I'd kept to myself for so long. If Mum hadn't gotten sick, she would have kicked you out. You were never good enough for her, not even close. I saw the shock on his face as he shot up from his chair. Jeff wasn't used to being spoken to in this way, and he was surprised that I was finally standing up to him. What did you say to me? He demanded, forming a fist in his right hand. You heard, I shot back defiantly. You're a drunk, a bully, and a scumbag, and I know what you've done to my sister. You're not getting away with it, you sick bastard. His anger reached boiling point as he stood up from his chair, his huge frame dominating our small living room as he marched towards me, his fists clenched and his face filled with pure rage. You little shit, he roared. How dare you speak to me like that after all I've done for you? I'm going to teach you a lesson you won't forget. This was my cue to run. I sped out of the room and through the front door, tearing down the pavement. Jeff chased after me, stomping across the tarmac like an enraged gorilla as he screamed vile abuse and threats. Thankfully, it was close from our house to the phone booth. I saw Alice there waiting for me, holding the door open whilst screaming for me to hurry. I reached the phone box just in time, slamming the door shut behind me. Jeff got there a moment later, crying out in bloody fury as he banged his fists against the glass and tried to break in. I used all my strength to shut the door, but knew I couldn't keep him out for long. But at that moment, the phone began ringing, and I experienced a surge of adrenaline. Alice grabbed hold of the receiver, holding it up to my ear. I heard the entity's deep voice as he spoke just four words. Well done, my children. In an instant, Jeff stopped banging on the door and stepped back. I don't know what he sensed or saw, but the expression on his face was one of pure terror. And then we saw the dark shadow moving out from behind the trees, creeping forwards and towards its prey. I still need help explaining what exactly this beast was. The best way I can describe it would be a shadow in the shape of a man, a darkness that had somehow taken physical form. Jeff froze when he saw it. He didn't try to run or fight. I don't know whether he was paralyzed by terror or held by some black magic. In any case... I doubt there was anything he could have done against this all-powerful, supernatural entity. 
It's not easy to explain what happened next. The shadow didn't strike Jeff as much as it absorbed him, the darkness swallowing him up as if it were physically removing his soul from his body. He emitted a blood-curdling cry, and I turned away, holding Alice tightly as we closed our eyes and tried to block out the horrifying screams. Mercifully, the attack was soon over. I sheepishly looked up to see Jeff's lifeless body lying on the pavement. I watched as the shadow moved away, its dark appetite satisfied as it returned to its own realm. Then I heard the beast's master speaking down the phone, and he said, He is mine now. There followed a brief pause before I heard a man screaming in the background, crying in agony as he pleaded for his soul. Please, please, God, somebody, please help me. It was Jeff, and he was scared. I don't know what they had in store for him, and I don't care to imagine. Jeff's screams soon faded, and the dark master spoke once again. The debt has been paid, and I will keep my word. Your mother shall be set free. I don't know what came over me then, but I couldn't leave it like this. I want to speak with her, I demanded. There was a tense pause on the other end of the line, and for a terrible moment I thought I'd gone too far, possibly jeopardizing our deal. But finally, he replied, As you wish. A few more seconds passed before I heard her voice, and my heart almost jumped out of my chest. Carl? Alice? We're both here, Mom. I answered tearfully whilst holding up the receiver so Alice could hear. I'm sorry you had to go through this, my babies, but I'm so proud of you both. I wanted to protect my children, but you two saved me. Don't leave us, Mom. We need you, Alice pleaded. I have to, darling. There's no other way. I miss you both so much. And we will meet again one day, but you need to live your life and be happy. Just remember that your mother loves you and will always watch over you. There was so much more that I wanted to say, but we ran out of time as the call came to a sudden end, and we were left listening to an ominous dial tone, our one link to the afterlife now broken. The following hours and days were chaotic and emotional, but we got through them. The police asked us some questions about Jeff's death, but nothing we couldn't handle. The official cause of death was listed as a heart attack. Jeff was a middle-aged man, overweight and a heavy drinker. There were no wounds on his body, and so nobody suspected foul play. We did get placed in care for a short time, but ultimately my sister and I went to live with our grandparents up north. I won't claim the next few years were easy, but we survived. What we'd been through together brought Alice and me closer. Now we're adults and living our best lives, just like our mother ordered. We rarely speak about the bizarre events of those three consecutive nights in the late 90s, although we often share memories of our late mother, recalling the good times. I still don't know what the dark entity that held our mother really was, or where exactly we sent Jeff. I try not to think about it, but if there's one thing I've learned from all this madness, it's that family is everything. The love between a devoted parent and their children is unbreakable, and this connection will continue, even beyond the grave. You've been listening to The Red Phone Box by Finn McCool.
And now, to close out our evening, I give you Bird's Eye View by Evan Baufman. What the fuck was I doing at the top of a pine tree? I stood shakily on a wooden platform at least a hundred feet above the ground. Looking up, I gathered I was little more than a slam dunk away from touching nothing but the sky. A hundred feet up. Jesus Christ. I felt like the world's worst pirate, lost and quivering on a ship's mast, overlooking a sea of forest green terrain. Whenever the structure beneath my feet creaked, my heart broke free of its ribcage prison. I hadn't been cool with heights since childhood, not since I fell off a ladder at eight, attempting to retrieve a frisbee from my parents' roof. I didn't play with frisbees anymore, either. I never rode roller coasters, preferred motels to skyscraper hotels, and always made sure to snack on sleeping pills before I got on a plane. So, zip lining? Me? Really? With a quaking palm, I attempted to steady myself against a nearby tree branch, closing my eyes and praying to God, something I hadn't done since Dad had his triple bypass four years ago. If he gave a shit, God was likely staring down at me, shaking his head, cursing me for wasting his time because it's not like I wasn't safe. I wore a harness, a tangle of straps that hugged me from my groin up to my shoulders. Multiple carabiners connected me to a pair of flexible bungee cords. The cords themselves were secured to a thick metal cable, which itself was snugly wired around the entirety of the tree's trunk. In other words, there was no way I would fall to my death. Probably. In the event of an unexpected plummet, Cords would hold me to cable, and the helmet affixed to my skull would protect my brain from smearing against tree bark. Hopefully. Gotta trust the equipment, the instructor, Ty, had said during our ten-minute tutorial session. Remembering Ty's words, I nodded and opened my eyes. Beside me, my girlfriend Lisa smiled. Are you good? she asked. She took my gloved hand in hers and squeezed. Could she feel me trembling through the leather? Even if she could, I'd blame it on the icy wind blustering around us. The weather app had said it would be 75 and sunny, but the sky was gray. Clouds gathered above us like growing puffs of smoke. We had left the smog-ravaged landscape of L.A. 300 miles behind us, hoping for a more scenic getaway in the Sierra Nevadas. Lisa had warned me against packing only t-shirts and shorts. She said that nights in the mountain community of Verdant Hill would get chilly, so I had brought a hoodie and jeans, but left them back at the cabin, naively thinking a California July afternoon would be kinder to my exposed extremities. Lisa wore pants and a long sleeve shirt, looking plenty comfortable even in her harness and helmet. Thanks again for doing this, she said. Are you having fun, even a little? It was the third Thursday of our summer vacation. We both taught English to sophomores at South Angeles High. We'd begun dating last semester, and now that school was out, we finally had time to enjoy ourselves and get to know each other better. My idea of fun was spending hours in used bookstores and libraries, going to museums and plays, and watching films and theaters from reclined seats. Lisa's fun was being outside, at the beach or on a hike. She was a bit of an adrenaline freak and wanted to actually live the adventures she read about in books. She'd swum with sharks in Hawaii in previous summers and skydived over Australia, but she'd never gone ziplining. Until now. With me. I figured an occasional journey outside my comfort zone was worth it, if it meant I got Miss Lisa Booth. Her smile, her laughter, and her attention. I did a decent job of mimicking her grin. Yeah, I said. It's not as bad as I thought. It's so much fucking worse. She added, 
Well, we're halfway there. Then we can toast your bravery at the Pickled Possum. That was the name of the saloon we'd driven past on the way to Zoom and Zipline Canopy Tours. I'd mentioned distaste for the improper spelling of the United States-only marsupial. Opossums lived in North America. Possums inhabited other continents. I said, I'll be sure to take a shot of something manly, like moonshine, maybe. She giggled. <laughs> right. We all know Brett Houston's more of a lemon drop kind of guy. Did I hear lemon drop? Come on, man, for real? It was one of the frat bros we were on tour with. The blonde one with the Oakleys and surfer tan. I couldn't remember his name. He'd mentioned it earlier. All three of the bros had introduced themselves and their Cal State Monterey pride back at base camp. But I didn't really give a shit about these clowns. This experience was supposed to be about Lisa and me. Not Lisa, me, and a trio of undergrad pricks who couldn't stop leering at my girlfriend's ass. Stay away from that lemon drop shit, bro. Beach Bum continued his interrogation of me. What, you don't like whiskey? I wasn't certain if he was referring to whiskey with an E-Y or whiskey with a Y, so I asked him to clarify. Beach Bum's pale brother, Freckles, was listening in. He said, What's the difference? I explained. Other than the spelling, whiskey with no E is distilled in Scotland, Canada, or Japan. Whiskey with an E is distilled in Ireland or the U.S., Freckles clapped his friend on the back. Never thought I'd be learning shit on vacay. We're educators, Lisa said. Can't let any teachable moments pass us by. I knew that was a gentle jab at my propensity for know-it-allism. Teachers? Both of you? Beach Bum's jaw had dropped a couple of inches. Him, I believe. Freckles jabbed a thumb in my direction. But you? He gave Lisa the once-over once again. If you were my teacher... Freckles didn't finish his thought. But Beachbum had no problem saying, I don't think I'd get much learning done. No offense. Lisa didn't respond other than to look away at the expansive wilderness around us. Should I say something? Defend her honor? Put the jerks in their place for making her feel uncomfortable? I didn't say a word. What was I going to do? Get in an altercation with meatheads ten years my junior, seven stories above the earth? Instead, I squeezed Lisa's hand, reminding her that I was there, just like she'd done for me. The reality was that Lisa was a tall, athletic, olive-skinned beauty. She could have been on magazine covers... But she enjoyed working with kids, and she liked the perks of our profession, such as the months off for breaks and vacations. All throughout her teaching career, she'd had to endure teenage creeps saying inappropriate things about her, to her face and behind her back, none of which ever stopped her from doing her job, but I knew she sometimes wished she'd taught another age group. Were these college assholes now making her regret our trip into the trees? I pictured myself disconnecting Beach Bum's carabiners and dropkicking his dumb ass to the forest floor after doing my best King Leonidas impression. This is unacceptable! Standing at the edge of the platform was Instructor Ty. He shouted, Incoming! as the final member of the three douches approached us. Our tour package included six different aerial runways, a series of overhead cables strung from one treetop to another. The first pair of runways had been practice runs, the first one only 100 meters in length, and the second only 200 meters in length. We were at the end of our group's third run, a 300-meter ride that had zipped me along breathlessly at 35 miles per hour. I pulled Lisa closer to me as QB3 raced our way. More than once, the young man had mentioned his role as a backup quarterback for the CSU Monterey football team. 
Dude, he's flying, bro, Beach Bum observed. Ty waved his hands in the air, a signal for the person ziplining to slow the fuck down. QB3 raised his left hand, pressing down ever so slightly on the cable above him. The simple touch slowed his momentum enough for him to land gracefully on the platform beside us. Woo! QB3 pumped a fist as Ty detached him from the runway cable. Hell yeah! That was definitely the sickest one yet! Ty said, Perfect landing! as he connected QB3's cords and harness to the wire surrounding the tree trunk. It was our holding position before we were ready for the next run. I only do perfect, QB3 boasted. I held my tongue. Wouldn't he be starting for the team if his coach thought he was perfect? QB3 high-fived his bros. This shit's got me hyped! He whooped again into the darkening sky. Ty said, If you thought that was great, this next run is almost half a mile long. Half a fucking mile? Lisa must have read my mind. She rubbed my arms, which had prickled with goosebumps. You got this. Ty said, Everyone's favorite part of the course. You get lots of time to enjoy the view. He brought a walkie-talkie up to his lips and gave the okay for his partner instructor, Colin, to zip on over. Ty always led the runs while Colin brought up the rear. Both men appeared to be in their late twenties. They had long hair and mountain man beards. They were very laid back and probably stoned, even though we, as guests, had to sign waivers promising we weren't under the influence of drugs or alcohol. The wind suddenly picked up speed. The entire tree seemed to sway with each powerful gust, and the platform creaked on cue. Incoming! QB3 pressed up against Lisa as Colin arrived. The football player stepped back when Lisa shot him a dirty look. <laughs> Sorry, he said, with no remorse evident in his voice. He shared a smile with his friends. Colin unhooked himself from the cable run. He secured himself to the tree alongside us. That was pretty awesome, huh? We all shared similar sentiments, even me. The last thing I needed was to be teased by some dipshits for my fear of heights. All right, said Colin. Time for another picture. He unzipped a pocket on his jacket and removed a small digital camera. Zoom in zipline canopy tours had us leave our phones and wallets in lockers back at base camp. No one wanted any valuables to fall forever into the woods. For an additional fee of 50 bucks, we could get copies of Colin's photos in case Lisa and I wanted to commemorate our time with QB3 and his cronies. The rest of us huddled around the tree. QB3 accidentally brushed up against Lisa again. Colin held the camera up to his eye. Say Gouda! Before each picture, he rattled off the name of a different kind of cheese. He must have had the munchies. In the distance, something boomed. It sounded like an explosion. Colin didn't snap the photo. He turned and, like everyone else, searched for the source of the noise. That was thunder, I said. Ty shook his head. Nah, they must be blasting in the mountain again. Lisa asked, What does that mean, blasting in the mountain? Ty said, They've been doing it for like a week now, right Colin? Colin nodded slowly. They want to reroute the highway, create a tunnel, a shortcut for everybody. He continued to look off in the distance. They using dynamite for that? Beach Bum wondered. A C4 or some shit. Freckles offered. I shrugged. Sounded like thunder to me. I mean, it looks like it's getting pretty stormy, doesn't it? The clouds were almost black now. Light rain began to fall. Ty shared a glance with Colin. Yeah, maybe we should get going. Colin pocketed the camera without taking a picture. Sorry about this, guys. Never seen the weather turn so quickly before. 
He now had his walkie-talkie in hand. Fucking weird, Ty muttered as he hurried us all around the tree to the other side of the platform. His laid-back attitude had vanished. We wouldn't knowingly bring you out in something like this. We stood before the fourth run now, the half-a-mile path to the next tree. The runway cable traveled so far that I couldn't see its end. After connecting himself to the fourth run, Ty said to Colin, Get all these guys going, then radio base camp. We gotta do this fast. Colin nodded. Ty stepped off the platform and soon became a speck on the horizon. Come on, come on, Colin urged QB3. You first. Our order reversed on each subsequent run. As Colin hooked him up properly, QB3 asked, What's going on? What's the big deal? Because, dumbass, Lisa said, you probably don't want to be struck by lightning while you're up here, do you? I wanted to high-five her then, but it wasn't the best time for such pleasantries. Across the sky, light crisscrossed within Cumulonimbus. Lightning! shouted Freckles. Fuck! Rain fell more steadily, but it wasn't a deluge quite yet. There's no other way down? Beach Bum asked. Colin shook his head. The fastest, safest way out of this is to finish the course. Ty's voice crackled on the walkie-talkie. I'm ready, Colin. Send him. Over. Copy. On his way. Over. Colin looked at us and said, You guys, I think we'll be fine. This run takes you over a really cool-looking valley. Try to have some fun while you're out there. He put a hand on QB3's shoulder. Remember, pull your knees up to your chest like you're in a cannonball position. It'll make you go faster. QB3 said, I'm Gucci. And he was off. Lisa stepped up to be strapped to the runway. Colin went to work. The wind roiled, slinging raindrops at us like BB pellets. Better be getting our money back for this fucking shit, Freckles said. Fuck yeah, we better, Beach Bum agreed. Colin assured them everything would be squared away once we returned to safety. Lisa smirked at me. Sorry for dragging you out here. You were right. My teeth chattered. This is way more exciting than a library. She gave me a thumbs up. Everything's going to be okay. This is what it feels like to be alive. Parts of me were pretty numb now. I couldn't really feel my fingers or my toes, but I was more than alive when Lisa pulled me over and gave me a long kiss. Ty spoke through the walkie-talkie. Colin, we're good. Send the next one. Over. Gotcha. Coming now. Over. To Lisa. Whenever you're ready. Cannonball, if you can. Hurry the fuck up, Teach. Freckles snapped. Lisa waved to me. Bye. She stepped into the air and went on her way. I got to the platform's edge and panic burrowed into my chest again racing through the middle of a thunderstorm attached to half a mile of metal. No problem. No. Big fucking problem. I shuddered. My spine wasn't the only part of me tingling. Colin secured my cords to the run. He encouraged me to cannonball. Freckles and Beach Bum began to bicker about whose idea it was to come all the way out here for this. Tie on the walkie-talkie. Colin, we're ready. Over. Colin's reply. Here he comes. Over. Then, in my ear, Good to go, man. I said another silent prayer. Fireworks appeared to dance in the clouds right above the tree. Startled by the sight, I stumbled off the platform and zipped into the unknown. The harness held me in a sitting position like I was on a swing. I leaned back a bit and crossed my ankles, lifting my knees toward my chest, turning myself into a more aerodynamic human cannonball. As I soared through the air, it felt as if I was being blasted from all directions by open freezer doors. Raindrops were tiny icicles biting at my skin. 
Apparently, the wind would do its best to make this an uncomfortable ride. It tried forcing me into a dizzying spin. Fuck. Don't lose control. Don't lose control. Don't lose control. Don't lose control. One of the cords holding me to the zip line had little handlebars in place. They were there to help me turn side to side in case I wanted a clearer view of my surroundings on a sunny day. Right now, though, I just wanted the fucking things to keep me straight and steady. With all of my strength, I gripped the handlebars and tried to course correct. Combating against the spin, I turned hard to the left. Fuck! Turn too hard! Too hard, too hard, too hard! I began to spin in the opposite direction. Trees, other vegetation, and boulders had become nonsensical blurs of shadow. Suddenly, the ground below dropped even further. I had entered the valley. I was twice as high up in the air now. Fuck! I offered another feeble prayer to the big guy in the sky, jostling the handlebars again and again, attempting to get aligned with the tree I was speeding toward. How close was I to the platform? How close was I to Lisa? To my left, a lightning bolt drilled into the valley below, momentarily coloring everything in electric blue. Shit! How close was I to that? Then, the ground rose again. The valley was behind me. I was closer to Earth. I had managed to calm my spin. The tree was fast approaching, growing larger by the second. Another bolt of lightning crashed, this time to my right. Get me the fuck off of this thing! With rain battering my face, I couldn't see if Ty was giving me the signal to slow down. I approximated I was about 50 feet from the tree when I lifted my left hand. It felt like as good a time as any to decrease my speed. In my panic, however, I pressed down on the zip line with too much force, and instead of easing myself onto the platform, I stopped my momentum completely as if I'd suddenly pulled on an emergency brake. I now dangled out on the wire, about 30 feet from safety. I couldn't see anyone clearly, but I could hear Ty yelling. You have to pull yourself in! Hurry, Brett! Lisa screamed. You can do it! Pull myself in? Even QB3 sounded panicked. Pull, man! Fucking pull! Lightning struck something below me. A bush, maybe? Whatever it was, it burst into flame. So... The plant life around us was still dry enough to catch fire. Good to know. The lightning strike jump-started my engine. I turned my back to the tree and, hand over hand, began pulling myself toward it. As I pulled, my face turned to the sky a little. I could see individual raindrops as they fell around me. And I also saw a massive angel descending from the heavens. Had God actually answered one of my prayers? The being glided beneath clouds on enormous black wings. It shrieked like a banshee. I quickly realized this was no savior. It was a giant bird, the size of a Cessna aircraft. A colossal condor? An enormous eagle? A humongous hawk? What the hell was I even looking at here? A hallucination? I must have stopped pulling in my stupor because the others were calling my name. I snapped out of it and allowed nothing else to distract me the rest of my way to the tree. Once I was at the platform, Ty yanked me closer to him. He immediately unclipped me from the run and secured me to the trunk. Lisa sobbed, clutching onto me. Helplessly watching the lightning strikes, she hadn't been sure I would return to her alive. I wrapped my arms around her, assuring her that I was okay. The bird, I said. Do you guys see the... Yes, QB3 said through gritted teeth. Shut the fuck up and look! Fifty meters out, the bird circled over the zipline like a vulture in search of sustenance. 
The fucker was chasing you, bro, QB3 whispered. We saw it come out of the clouds and shoot lightning at you. I stammered. What does that mean? Lisa explained. It opened its mouth, its, its beak, and... And lightning came out of it, and... And... She held on to me even tighter. QB3 gestured to Ty. This dude's into Indian shit. He says he thinks it's a... What did you call it, bro? Thunderbird. Ty stared off at the animal. QB3 nodded. That's right, Thunderbird. I thought that shit was just the name of an old car. Be quiet, Ty hissed. It looks confused now that it's lost sight of its prey. I didn't like being called that. Prey. Ty said, We seem to be hidden, all right? Let's keep it that way. Thunderbirds. I'd read about them when I was a kid. Creatures from Native American folklore. Entities that brought along bad weather. Harbingers of doom. Not folklore. Not myth. A real-life monster. Right there in front of us. The more I looked at it, the less it resembled a bird. It was covered in dark feathers, but its head looked more reptilian. Dinosaur-like. A pterodactyl? A pteranodon? I never learned the difference. Or could it have been something else entirely? A dragon? After circling for another minute, it lifted itself back into the sky with a squawk. It disappeared into the clouds. We waited in silence. The wind whistled. Then, QB3 asked the obvious question. What about the other guys? Ty glared. I told you already, the walkie-talkie stopped working. It's a cheap piece of plastic. Probably wasn't waterproof. Okay, said QB3. But I mean, do we wait for them or do our own thing? Lisa was aghast. You'd leave your own friends behind out here? QB3 shrugged. They're with that other dude, Colin. Ty shook his head in disbelief. I'm not leaving anyone behind. Not an option, understood? We wait it out and hope they get here soon. Hopefully, Colin's been able to radio base camp and someone's coming to... Half a mile away, a vibrant orange burst of light arced skyward. Someone had fired off a flare gun. Colin, Ty said, probably trying to get base camp's attention. QB3 asked, Well, is that a good idea with that fucking bird out there? They don't know about it, I guessed. They haven't seen it yet. At that moment, someone started hooting and hollering for us. Beach Bum was on the zip line, having the time of his life, completely oblivious to his danger. But the Thunderbird never came. Beach Bum flew, cheering, into our canopy with no problem whatsoever. Ty got him connected to the trunk in no time and asked if Colin had radioed base camp yet. I don't know, was Beach Bum's reply. Walkie talkies busted, I think. That's why he just crossed his fingers and sent me. The idiot then started loudly declaring how dope that run had been. We eventually got him to quiet down. We tried explaining our situation, but, of course, he thought it was some kind of joke. We saw the lightning, but not a giant-ass bird. He patted my shoulder. Glad to see you're not barbecue, man. Half a mile away, a monster shrieked. Lightning struck. Once. Twice. Three times. A pine tree went up in flames. We cried out in collective surprise, staring at one another in shock. Beach Bum said, They got out of there, right? Before the fire... No one uttered a word. We waited for someone, anyone, to appear on the horizon. We didn't have to wait long. 
Freckles was alive, zipping toward us and screeching in terror. A red-hot fireball was also on the line behind him, following the frat bro with sizzling speed. And chasing after the ball of flame was none other than the screaming Thunderbird. Oh, fuck! Beachbum cried. See? That was QB3. As it got closer, it became apparent that the fireball was actually Colin. He was silent and likely already dead, his corpse a fiery projectile. About 100 meters out, his fire finally died in the rain. The Thunderbird halted its chase, opened its wings, and lifted up into the storm. Freckles landed on the platform seconds later. Ty hurriedly removed him from the line. What was left of Colin came in moments after, a charred, smoking husk of a man. Ty attempted to catch his friend's body, but when his hands met Colin's flesh, all Ty did was accidentally rip free long strips of his buddy's papery skin. With Colin's flesh stuck to his palms, Ty yowled in disgust, shoving the rest of Colin away from him. The corpse reversed its course on the line and returned the way it came from, finally coming to rest 30 meters away from our group. Wide-eyed, Freckles said, That thing came out of nowhere! It burned up the fucking tree, man! Colin pushed me out, and he jumped out too, even though he was on fucking fire, bro! The Thunderbird returned. It zeroed in on Colin's corpse, landing on the line like a mutant crow atop a telephone wire. The run sagged under the creature's incredible weight. Lisa buried her face in my chest as the beast tore Colin apart, swallowing hunks of him in wet, smacking gulps. I watched Ty through all of this, the only person who could possibly get us out of this nightmare. The man was in a daze. He couldn't stop looking at the pieces of calling glued to his hands. He had to get it together, though, and fast. We needed to be on the next run already before the Thunderbird went hunting again. The problem was, Ty hadn't even secured freckles to the tree trunk yet, and he wouldn't stop talking to himself. Colin, I'm sorry. So sorry. Colin, I'm sorry. So sorry, Colin. I'm sorry. Ty, I said. Ty, we've got to go. The Thunderbird shrieked. It was having a hard time getting the last bit of Colin free from its harness. The monster pulled on the harness. Pulled. The zipline strained under the creature's forceful yanking. The zipline snapped. Most of the wire fell harmlessly away from the bird, but the small section still connected to our tree whipped back to us like an angry snake. I threw Lisa and myself to the platform floor to miss the metal cable as it flew into the canopy. QB3 also ducked. No one else moved a muscle. The cable attacked without prejudice. It caught beach bum in the stomach, freckles in the chest, and tie in the throat before it fell limp to the forest floor. Beach Bum's intestines spilled through the front of his harness. Freckles went flying out of the tree altogether, plummeting eighty feet to his death. Ty's head separated from his shoulders completely. Christ. Jesus. Fucking... Bile rose in my throat. I sucked it back down. Twice. I didn't need to puke on my girlfriend. I needed to think. We needed to get out of this insane, gory mess. Beneath me, Lisa asked, What happened? What happened? Close your eyes, I said. Keep them shut. Between QB3 and me... Beach Bum wouldn't stop screaming. It made sense, since his guts were now on the outside. But Beach Bum's ear-splitting pain was drawing the Thunderbird to the tree. Flapping its wings, 
the animal approached. A quick thinker, QB3 lifted Ty's decapitated head by the helmet. Oh, fuck, he said. Oh, God. He stood at the platform's edge, pulled his arm back, and tossed the head into the air for a touchdown. The Thunderbird caught the pass in its beak and swallowed. Satisfied for the moment, the monster gave the tree a wide berth. What now? QB3 asked. He pointed to Ty's body. I can't throw all that! On his knees, Beachbum looked at his belly and pleaded, Help me. Jesus, help me. Lisa said, We have to... I have to leave bait. She stood, gently pushing me aside. Had she seen what I'd allowed QB3 to do? With a grimace on her face, Lisa kicked Beachbum between the shoulders. The guy fell forward out of the canopy. Because he was still connected to the trunk, he just dangled below us, agonizing. She turned to me and QB3. I've been paying attention, and I think I know how to hook us onto the next run. Of course she did. My badass, intelligent woman. QB3 wasn't buying it. Nuh-uh. I'm not letting you hook me up all wrong just so I can fall off the fucking thing. Okay. Lisa nodded. Works for me. Stay here. With that. She pointed below. With its talons, the Thunderbird now clung to the side of our tree, ripping at beach bum with its beak. The entire tree trembled every time it shook a piece loose from the guy. I wouldn't have been surprised if the whole thing toppled over, with us still in it. Lisa guided me around the trunk. Wait, wait, I'm coming too, said the quarterback. Good idea, said Lisa. We were on the other side of the platform now. The fifth run looked relatively short, a couple hundred meters at most. This one angled downward. It would take us much closer to the ground. QB3 had the balls to say, Let me go first? Yeah, said Lisa. You be the test dummy. As she hooked him up to the run, she hesitated a couple of times, trying to determine if she was doing things right. You're doing great, I assured her. Much better than I would be. Okay, she said to QB3. I think you're ready. When you get to the other side, reach up and unhook this. She pointed. And this, too. Then, hook yourself to that other trunk. Understand? QB3 nodded. Gotcha. He leapt off the platform. We watched him reach the other tree. Lisa let out a deep breath. Thank God. She smiled at me. Your turn. I couldn't be in better hands right now. I said this even though I could see her palms shaking. As she hooked me into place, she said, No one's going to believe this story at the pickled possum tonight. She patted me on the butt. Now, go. So, I went. The run was, thankfully, fairly uneventful. It felt great to be getting closer to the end of all this. Once on the next platform, QB3 helped me unhook myself. Behind me, Lisa shouted something. I watched QB3's eyes go wide. He backed up against the tree trunk and screamed. The Thunderbird was right fucking there, homing in on us, an unstoppable missile, its claws outstretched. I felt like a chipmunk, a mouse, a squirrel. Pray. The monster scooped both of us up in its talons and took off. Correction. It held all of me, but just the lower half of QB3. His upper body was probably still attached to the tree trunk below. I thought I was scared of heights before, but now I was inside clouds. I didn't want to vomit, but after all I'd been through, I'd certainly earned the right to hurl. 
I puked for a minute straight, adding to the rainfall. The way the Thunderbird held me, I was peeking out from between its toes. I watched as the creature chased lightning trails. It dove, twisted, and corkscrewed in the storm, adding to my nausea. If within striking distance, the creature would open its beak and bite into the end of a lightning bolt, slurping up a wild piece of energy like a worm. After each electric slurp, the bird's eyes glowed bright blue. I'm unsure how long the monster played this game, but it eventually broke free of the clouds again. We were at a mountain peak. We flew along the massive rock formation and entered the mountain through a crevice split open on its side. This was the creature's lair, a cave lit by large patches of phosphorescent moss. The Thunderbird released me from its grip. I rolled onto the dusty floor into a pile of rotting animal carcasses, mostly deer from what I could tell. QB3's legs joined me. I played a possum, doing my best to fit in with the other guests. The smell was terrible. Good thing I probably didn't have anything left to vomit. The bird hopped on its feet to the far side of the cave and chirped a sad song. I opened an eye and watched as the beast nuzzled against the body of another thunderbird. Only this creature lay on its side, lifeless. It was skeletal. Very dead, practically fossilized. Dead for centuries, maybe. Perhaps gone for millennia. The living Thunderbird's eyes burned blue. It spat lightning at its long-lost companion. The other monster's body convulsed and rose off the floor as it was pumped full of electricity, but it eventually fell back, motionless, still very much dead. The Thunderbird tried round after round of its twisted defibrillation. I couldn't believe it. The thing was trying to Frankenstein its friend back to life. I looked around at all of the recent kills. If Thunderbird 2 somehow awoke from its slumber, it would have plenty of fresh things to eat. The last thing I wanted was to be around for the family reunion. Or... Better yet, I could ensure that there would be no reunion at all. The severed head of a big buck was to my right. Its antlers looked impressively sharp. The Thunderbird had its tail to me as attended to its compatriot. Now was the time to attack. I gripped the antlers, one in each hand. They were heavy and should do plenty of damage. Or... Did they just feel heavy because they were still attached to the deer's skull? Either way, I held the buck's head level with my own and charged. The Thunderbird turned to me. Its eyes glowed blue. The monster opened its beak, ready to fire. I rammed the antlers right up into its chest, piercing its lonely heart. The Thunderbird shrieked, unfurled its wings, and attempted to escape its agony. The animal leapt past me and fled for some place kinder. But the antlers were in deep. The Thunderbird flew haphazardly from the mountain and eventually careened out of control, crashing into a twisted heap somewhere on the highway below. I learned of this later once a rescue helicopter found me standing at the edge of a cave that should not have been there. It seemed that, in explosive efforts to create a new tunnel, workers had inadvertently opened the Thunderbird's home to the outside world, briefly unleashing the legendary beast onto Verdant Hill, California. How had an animal of its size survived inside the mountain for so long? with such limited resources at its disposal? How had the monster and its counterpart become trapped inside the mountain to begin with? How could an entity like the Thunderbird even exist in the real world? Scientists would argue over these very questions for decades to come. 
Me, though? After initial interviews with various authorities, I decided to celebrate being alive. Sitting at a window booth inside the pickled possum that night, Lisa and I stared at a full moon in a cloudless, starry sky. What other nightmares awaited us, lurking just out of view? We pondered this together over several lemon drop shots, our hands shaking no more. You've been listening to Bird's Eye View by Evan Baufman. Well, listeners, that concludes our episode tonight. I'd like to thank Finn McCool and Evan Baufman for letting us feature their stories this evening, and I'd also like to thank you all for joining me. As always, I'll be back next week at the same day and time to give you more tales to chill your bones. In the meantime, listeners, stay spooky. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show, and that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. As for me personally, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, username Viking Guitar, and also on Instagram as Viking Guitar Productions. In particular, if you're looking for someone to provide voice work for your own project, or are in need of audio production of any sort, it would be wonderful to chat. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener, and if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Nikki McSorley and Eric Peabody. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. 
If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave us a kind comment. Lastly, don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all of your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.